today is we're going to be talking about next level health and I'll be the host. So I'm Hannah and I'm a pharmacist by background. I live in Nelson and I work across the hospital and also in community pharmacy and then I also spend a bit of time running the Better Base. So I'm very excited to be helping more people to eat more plant foods and helping people to be healthier through that and looking after our environment at the same time. And the star of today's show is Dr. Luke Wilson. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about him and all of the amazing things that he's been doing over the last few years. And he has been very much ahead of his time, having been in the plant-based world for many years now. So Dr. Luke Wilson is a GP based in Wellington, but he's also worked in Santa Rosa, California as an intern for Dr. John McDougall at the McDougall Health and Medical Center, and also alongside Dr. Michael Clapper and Dr. Alan Goldhammer at the True North Health Center. In 2016, Dr. Luke conducted the first whole foods plant-based study of its kind in New Zealand, in Brisbane. And he's also completed a certificate in plant-based nutrition. He's also certified as a physician with the International Board of Lifestyle Medicine. He's a member of the New Zealand Medical Association and was New Zealand's first member of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. He has experienced health helping hundreds of people transform their lives by adopting a whole food plant-based lifestyle. So we're really excited that Luke's come today to share his time and his knowledge with us and talking about this topic of next level health. So he's going to be discussing why whole plant foods are the optimal foods for us to be eating as humans and also covering five that we might want to eat more of and five that we might want to be eating less of and why that is. So if you've got any questions through the presentation, then drop them down in the chat box and I'll be capturing some of those and then we'll have the question and answer session at the end. Kia ora everyone. I um, hope everyone's had a great start to the new year. And um, before I get started, um, I just wanted to say I've been keeping an eye on what's been going on in the group and everything and it's just awesome to see everyone you know, sort of getting into it and participating in there and it's been really interesting um, reading about sort of what brings you all to this um, to this stage and what you're hoping to get out of it. So um, all the best for that and I hope that um, the presentation that I do today is, is um, part of the start of things for you. So um, of course none of this would be possible without Hannah and so obviously we had a few um, difficulties getting everything sorted and we, we did jump on here at half past four to try and get everything smoothed out but um, Sometimes this is kind of the way things go. Now with this presentation I do, usually I try to make it a little bit interactive. Um, and so obviously you can type responses in the, in the um, box below if, um, if you're fast enough. Um, and we'll see how that goes. So anyway, as um, Hannah, Hannah gave me a really nice introduction, um, which is uh, good. And um, so you know that I'm uh, my name's Luke and I graduated from Otago Medical School in 2012 and also that in my last year I managed to um, travel to Santa Rosa in California um, where I worked with uh, Dr. John McDougall. Um, if you've seen Forks Over Knives um, then you'll know he's in that. He's the guy wearing the loud Hawaiian shirt and um, also Dr. Michael Clapper at the True North Health Centre um, and uh, he's in Cowspiracy and What the Health and he's the one who talks about calf growth fluid if you've seen those. Um, those Films now. Um, so when I was over there, it was, it was quite different because previously, obviously, I've had my my usual medical training in the hospitals, and um, I was working in Invercargill Hospital actually um, before I went over to to train with those guys, and it was very different um, the, the kind of medicine that I saw. And so we would see people roll into these places with literally bags of medications and supplements. And um, especially at the McGill um, program, we would see them be pretty much confiscated on the first day. Um, and then what I'd see is the things that they were taking the medications for, the, you know, the, the, the aches and pains, the high blood pressure, the high cholesterol um, for some of them. Actually, he was on a sclerosis study when I was there as well. So it was interesting to see those participants as well. But... So I would see these things, these ailments that people come in with just disappear. And especially with things like the blood pressure and the weight, um, that was within a matter of days, I saw differences in that. And that to me was nothing like I'd ever seen before in medicine. And even though obviously I went to those places knowing a little bit of the magic that was gonna happen there, 
um, having seen it with my own eyes, um, I, I just knew that it had to be something that I was going to bring back uh, with me to New Zealand and hopefully spread the word about this. And we've really come a long way since then. Um, anyhow, I'll get on with the talk. Um, that's enough about me. So today I'm going to talk about food and how you can eat to look and feel your best. And I chose to call my talk next level, actually I think Hannah chose to call my talk next level health. Um, but anyway, this got me to thinking, um, so back in the day, when I used to watch um, TV, one of my favourite shows was something called uh, Beyond 2000. And uh, each episode of, um, of that discussed uh, cool new stuff that science and technology was going to bring us in the distant future. So now that we're actually beyond 2000, there's this feeling that as, as we start to accumulate more knowledge, uh, more technology and more stuff, we're slowly but very surely levelling ourselves up. So we think that Things that are complex and new are good, and simple and basic, that's, you know, basic. So most of the time, um, this is a really good thing, you know. Um, for example, I love my iPhone, my iPad, my Apple Watch, and I think it's, it's great that we're moving to more renewable sources of energy, electric cars and eco-houses. And in medicine, it's no different. I don't want to go back to the old school stethoscope, and I definitely don't want to go back to the old school diabetes test. But how are we doing when it comes to our food? Any thoughts? This is the interactive part, so you can type in the in the box if you have any thoughts. Slow progress, clean through old ways. Food is all about making money. We're going backwards. Cool. Awesome. Awesome. So. I'm sure you, you'll agree that never before has there been so much variety, ready-made foods, food delivery services, we've got restaurants, supplements, superfoods, we've got nutritionists and other experts, and um, we even have nutrition facts and the allergens and the ingredients that are labelled on all of our foods. But at the same time, I'm sure you'd also agree that never before has there been so much confusion and controversy about what and how we should be eating. So should we go Paleo, Atkins, South Beach, 4-4-4, Dukan, or Mediterranean. High carb, low fat, or high fat, low carb. What about protein? Should we go vegetarian or vegan? What about protein? Should we forget about food for breakfast and drink coffee with butter in it instead? Should we be in ketosis? Should we eat only raw foods or only fruit? What about organics? Should we quit sugar? What about probiotics and fermented foods? Should we boil up bones and drink the gunk that's left over? Does my cholesterol even matter anymore? What about my gains? Should I blend my food or should I chew my food? So this evening, I'm hoping to talk about how you can level up and move past all of that. And the surprising thing is that the answer's been there all along. It's not about making things more complicated or even more flash. It's about going back to the basics. Because the optimal diet for humans is whole foods and mostly plants. So without getting too technical, what suggests to me that we should be mostly plant-based most of the time? Well, firstly, our closest ancestors are the chimpanzees and bonobos. Those guys eat plants. Nearly half of the chimp diet is figs, and just 3% of the average chimp diet comes from meat. On average, about nine days a year are meat days. So it's kind of like these guys are saving meat for barbecues on public holidays. When we look at our anatomy, we've essentially got the same equipment as herbivores. We have blunt teeth, long digestive tracts, and most of us have flattened nails instead of claws. Now, somewhere in between our ancestors and our anatomy is our microbiome. So these are the trillions of bacterial cells we have throughout our body especially in our gut, that we've finally realized are actually critically important to our well-being. So what we're finding out more and more now is that actually our microbiome too also just thrives on plants. Areas called the Blue Zones were first identified by National Geographic in 2005. And these are the locations that are home to the healthiest and longest living peoples on the planet. We've got Okinawa in Japan, Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica, Akuria in Greece, Sardinia in Italy, and Loma Linda in California. One thing that they all have in common is a diet that's mostly plant-based. On average, meat's eaten about five times a month, and their portion sizes are about the size of a pack of cards. 
So no disrespect to any of the blue zones, but we could say that they eat like chimps. For decades now, doctors and other researchers have been using plant-based eating plans to treat otherwise incurable diseases. Nathan Pritikin, Walter Kempner, Roy Swank, John McDougall, Dean Ornish, Neil Barnard, and numerous others have all demonstrated that a diet based around almost entirely whole foods from plants cures disease. Every day now we're seeing more and more research that affirms either that animal products are detrimental to human health or that foods of plant origin are beneficial. So there's simply no other way of eating that checks all of the boxes that a whole food plant-based eating pattern does. So I can tell you with certainty right now, just like Michael Pollan does, that we do best when we eat mostly plants. And others have shown that at least in certain cases, only plants is the ideal prescription. So what that means is despite all of our flash research, supplements, superfoods, and diets, all you really need to ask yourself to do is ask yourself these two questions when it comes to a food. So question one, is it from a plant? Question two, how close is it to something plucked from a tree, picked from a bush, or pulled from the earth? So let's have a go at that with some popular breakfast options. So interactive segment coming up. First up is yogurt. Is it from a plant? <laughs> you guys are good at this. No. Okay, so that's an automatic fail for yogurt. All right, so the next contender. Cocoa Pops. Is it from a plant? All right, this is a tricky one. There's, yep, there's, there's a bit of disagreement. Um, so technically, it is. Um, but how close is it to something plucked from a tree, picked from a bush, or pulled from the earth? Not close at all, exactly. So that's another fail. Now for the last one, bananas. Is it from a plant? Cool. Is it close to something? <laughs> Best food ever. <laughs> um, is it close to something plucked from a tree, picked from a bush, or pulled from the earth? I'm getting yeses there. So is it going to bring you closer to next level health? All right, here we go. So yeah, <laughs> hell yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so let's move on to a few specifics then, now that we've got that down. Um, perhaps you're already plant-based or vegan or vegetarian, or maybe you are paleo, gluten-free or sugar-free. Um, perhaps uh, if you're in Wellington, you like eating at Logan Brown. If you're in Auckland, maybe it's um, Little Bird Organics, or maybe you prefer fish and chips, wherever you are in New Zealand. Um, either way, um, we can all make better choices when it comes to food. So let's talk about a few simple changes that could make all the difference to how you look and feel. So first off, let's start with the bad guys. So these are five foods that we should cut down on or forget about completely if we want to look and feel our best. First up is eggs. Are they from a plant? No. Okay. So the US Department of Agriculture has actually warned the egg industry that they cannot claim the eggs are either healthy or nutritious. And it seems that eating even just one or two a week is risky. So if you're missing your scrambled eggs, um, then you can have some scrambled tofu instead. Next up is cheese. Is it from a plant? <laughs> okay. Good, good. Okay, so it's not. Um, so Dr. Neil Barnard's managed to write an entire book about cheese. Um, it's ultra processed, it's fatty, it's full of salt, hormones, and also substances that will keep you hooked. Um, so you can try some nutritional yeast. And as um, kind of a side note, um, but important, um, it's been confirmed that Dr. Barnard will be coming to um, Australia and New Zealand, um, what's well, going to be this year, um, in February. And uh, we've got some dates lined up for Wellington and Auckland. So um, see if you can make that, especially if you want to learn more about why not to eat cheese. So let's move along. So next up we have processed meats. Are they from a plant? Exactly, definitely not. Um, so I started out when I first wrote this um, saying processed meats, but given that I like to be honest about things, um, 
and probably you know the audience that I'm speaking to as well. I'm going to extend this to all mates. And though the World Health Organization only at the moment feels like they have enough evidence to say processed meats definitely cause cancer, um, and it, keep in mind that it took them 400 studies before they would decide that, um, meat in any shape or form appears to be detrimental to our health. And a really important point that I'd like to make is that it's not because of any chemicals or additives in meat that can be avoided by going free range, organic, cruelty free, or even sodium nitrate free. Um, nor is it simply because of the fat content that can be minimized by choosing premium or lean cuts. It's because of the nutritional properties that are intrinsic to all meats, uh, including the heme iron content, um, bacterial endotoxins, and animal protein. And interestingly, two of those three things are actually um, things that the, the meat industry has been very um, keen to let people know are uh, present in meat. So um, we just need to bridge that gap and let people know that actually heme iron is, is, seems to be um, quite bad for you, associated with um, type 2 diabetes especially, and um, animal protein also. So definitely no to meat. Um, and actually the medical profession is waking up to this as well, in about time. Um, and this was just um, late last year. Um, one of the most prestigious medical journals in the world, it's actually in the top three. Um, the Lancet, which um, published um, an editorial discussing the health and environmental impact of meat consumption, and it concluded like this. So what is a healthy amount of red or processed meat? It's looking like the answer for both the planet and the individual is very little. Saying this is one thing in getting the world to a place where we have the ability to balance the desire to eat whatever we want with our need to preserve the egg we rely on to sustain ourselves is quite another. The conversation has to start soon. So one of the answers, of course, um, could be our plant-based substitutes. So that's your sun-fed chicken, your no-meat mints, and uh, the Beyond Burger being a few examples. Um, be a little bit cautious about using these, though, because they all fail the second question. So obviously they're made from plants, but um, they're not close to anything that we would expect to find in nature. Um, and some of them actually have as much saturated fat as the meat they're replacing. Next up is oils. Are they from a... All right, so we're getting some uses. How do they go on our second question? Not good, <laughs> no, not so much. Cool, yeah, so it's actually, oil is probably, I would say it's the most processed stuff on the planet. So it actually takes a thousand olives to make a liter of olive oil. Um, just as sugar is 100% pure carbohydrate, oil is 100% pure fat. So what that means is that a tablespoon of oil is actually the same amount of energy as a scoop of ice cream. And we all know what's better. So hold the oil and have dessert instead. Next up are refined grains. So again, these are from a plant, but they've got the good stuff processed out. So these are really what gives carbs a bad name. So this is your white flour, your white rice, your white pasta, your white bread. So the best thing to do is just switch to whole grains. So buckwheat, quinoa, spelt, barley, oats, wholemeal pasta, red, brown, or black rice. All right, so that's five out of the way. So let's move on to some more positive stuff. Here are five foods uh, that will help you look and feel your absolute best. And no surprises, both of them are going to pass at both of our test questions, all of them. So first up, we've got leafy greens. And these are the best vegetables. So I want um, all of you to try to make them an everyday thing, like your new multivitamin, um, because they're simply full of stuff that's good for you. They also promote healthy blood flow throughout the body like a natural Viagra, which is no doubt why Dr. Esselstyn loves them so much. Next up are beans. So the Blue Zones love their beans and they eat about a cup every day. The Tarahumara Indians in Mexico, well those guys eat even more beans. For fun, they put on their sandals and race each other over 10 kilometers of rugged mountainous terrain kicking a wooden ball. And when the grown-ups are taking it seriously, they'll reportedly race anywhere from 50 to 240 kilometers over up to two days and nights. What could make this even more hardcore? Any ideas?
All right. <laughs> no one knows. Um, well, this often this often happens after when they're hungover after partaking in a corn beer fueled all night party. So enough said about that. Eat your beans. <laughs> we do have some ideas now. Okay. So berries. So these are the best fruits and they're full of antioxidants and uh, blackberries are supposedly the best of the best. Um, I like to diversify my berry portfolio and I just have mixed berries. They boost your immune system and they're good for the brain. And frozen is pretty much the same as fresh so you can treat yourself. But of course at this time of year we're usually um, spoiled with reasonably priced berries for a change. So um, if you can get, get hold of those or if you've grown some of your own that's even better. Next up is plant-based omega-3. So leafy greens are a really good source of um, plant-based omega-3 which is one of the reasons why I really like those. Um, but also one tablespoon of ground chia seed or flax seed or a small handful of walnuts and you'll have all the plant-based omega-3 you need for the day. So this reduces inflammation and the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 is what's really important. So it should be at least four to one um, but for most New Zealanders it could be 20, or 20 to 1 or higher. So that's another reason why you want to reduce your oils and other high fat foods. So even things like nuts, which we usually think are pretty healthy for us. Um, so if you look at an almond, for example, it's got a ratio of about 4,000 omega-6 for every omega-1 that's contained in it. So eating a lot of that kind of thing, you can quickly put that balance out of whack. And that's just another reason why the high fat plant foods can be a bit of, um, a bit of an issue. Uh, I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions about that later because they're everyone's favourites. All right, so broccoli. So Dr. Gregor used to fool medical and lectures by talking about a wondrous new therapeutic agent called Illicor B. He mentions broccoli more often in his book than uh, any other food, and it contains a special substance that's only found in cruciferous vegetables, which may prevent DNA damage, improve your immunity, boost your liver detox enzymes, protect your eyesight, and reduce inflammation. Um, but he says that you should chop up your broccoli at least 40 minutes before you cook it um, to unleash the substance, otherwise you can add some mustard powder. Alright, so there we go. So it's all pretty simple. So just asking yourself two questions of your food will get you most of the way towards looking and feeling your best every day. And if you really want to take it to the next level, um, you can do that too just by making a few small changes like we've talked about. And hopefully that's the kind of thing that you're looking at doing over the next you know, 48 hours or so. Um, so simply eating whole plant-based foods, you can achieve next level health today. Well, who would have guessed? All right. So just um, back to the announcement about Barnard before we get into the questions and things. So we've got the dates. Um, Wellington is on the 19th, um, which I believe is a Tuesday evening. And Auckland will be on the 20th of February. So save those dates. Um, and for any of you that are really into this stuff, um, then there are still uh, tickets available for the Australasian Nutrition and Healthcare Conference, which will be held in Melbourne. Um, and that will have um, Dr. Barnard as well. Um, also Dr. Scott Stoll, if you know from the Plant Nutrition Project and um, several others, um, international speakers. And I'll also be speaking there too. So if you can make it over for that, then awesome. Um, it is more aimed at health professionals, but um, anyone can turn up. Um, but it is sort of priced for health professionals as well. But you can certainly look into that. Um, but um, if, if you're looking for something closer to home to get excited about, um, then those dates for Dr. Neil Barnard um, have been uh, confirmed. So um, there should, I think we're also going to do a movie screening at that as well. Um, but again, to be confirmed. So details, it's not far off. Um, so details will be coming pretty soon, I would say. So I guess we're into our Q&A's, Hannah. <laughs> right. Let's see if this I'm technology is going to... Yeah, can I think we got through the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you now. Great, wonderful. Oh, thank you so much, Luke, that presentation. I definitely learn something every oh, time nice. I listen to you. And we're also yeah, happy to have time. you in New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So we've got lots of good questions coming through and keep them coming and we can go through as many as possible. So 
firstly, I've got a joint one that has come from Logan, and apologies if I say your name wrong, Gabo. Um, on the oils, are flax or hemp oil okay? Okay, um, so I guess it's, it's actually a really good question because both of those have, um, as you guys are probably aware, they do have more omega-3s in them. Um, I think the issue mostly with oils is more to do with the processing of it rather than, um, you know, in, in those cases. So I think certainly if you were to look at, say, versus um, sunflower oil or canola oil or something like that, um, you might be doing all right with those. Um, but there's no need to be using those for omega-3s and I guess if you wanted to get technical with it um, you've still got that really high calorie density in them and you've also got um, as as far as Dr. Esselstyn is concerned anyway and one of the reasons um, that he's very against oils is um, and you guys might remember from Forks Over Knives where he talks about the inner lining of the of the arteries um, which are the main blood vessels, which are the blood vessels taking the, the um, blood away from the heart. And they have on their innermost layer um, the endothelial cells. And what seems to happen after you have oil, no matter what kind it is, is it seems to um, cause damage to those and they find that um, those arteries are less able to, um, to dilate, which means to get larger. So um, I think that you know, it's it's possibly a little bit better for you, and the in the same in a similar kind of way as as butter is, you know, then then olive oil is better than butter, um, or say, olivani or something like that is better than butter. But um, other than that, there's there's no need to be taking those things for health. So I probably avoid, yeah. Great, and also just to add, there are a few people in the Taste of Plant Base that have mentioned that one of their goals is weight loss. So if you're reducing or eliminating oil, it's so dense in calories, so that's what's one place yeah. that it's often hiding. Um, so people often find that the weight does start to come off if they stop using the oil. Exactly, um, so exactly. It's, a, it's a really important to, point. Yeah, what's the best thing to substitute the oil with? And then also, what about coconut oil olive oil, cold press. Okay, well, coconut oil is probably the worst, so I think um, we won't even go there. It's actually very, very, very high in saturated fat, and so um, likely to push your cholesterol up, and um, I really think um, that's one that we'd all do well to stay away from. Uh, and what's the other one? So cold press, olive oil, it's, it's the same thing. Oil's oil, pretty much, whether it's you know, extra virgin, organic, cold pressed, or whether it's coconut oil, or whether it's, you know, we've just talked about hemp seed, flax seed. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think it probably sounds like a big leap at the moment because uh, for people who haven't tried eating without it, but after a while, you know, it only takes a week or two and then you can actually start to taste it in foods and it doesn't taste great, to be honest. Um, I think also that the weight loss point you brought up, Hannah, is really important too. Um, and for a lot of people, that can be the difference between losing weight and gaining weight. Um, I certainly know for, for me it makes a big difference. Um, and I just, I think that regardless of the type, um, it's probably something that, it's, it's very processed and it's something that we're best to steer clear of when we can. Yeah, great. A lot of people are asking the best replacement for oils. So I tend to use water if I'm stir frying. Um, and if you're adding it into baking, then um, generally you can get by without it. Um, search for whole food, plant-based baking, and yeah, there'll be a lot of recipes out there. And for spreads, someone's asked about spreads. Um, I generally go for things like hummus, a little bit of yeah. tahini or peanut butter, nut butters. Um, is there anything else that you'd recommend, Luke? No, I'd usually say to people hummus is quite a good replacement, especially if you make it, you know, without the tahini and things, um, then then that then that's a good idea. Uh, it's it's it depends on the individual taste and everything. And as far as cooking with it goes, it's a bit of trial and error at the start. And for some people who are just starting out with plant based, you know, don't get too hung up on, you know. But now that I've talked about it, at least um, you know that it's not healthy for you. So that's going to automatically mean that you're probably not putting two tablespoons of oil and 
you know, some recipes you might find it, it, it asks for a tablespoon, you might be able to cut that out completely and it make no difference to the taste. Or maybe it asks for two tablespoons and you cut it back to one or something. So small steps are okay, unless you've got, if you've got advanced cardiovascular disease, um, you should probably be making an appointment with anyone else. Um, but um, otherwise, for most of us, we can get away with a little bit here and there, but just, you know, the more that you can get out of the diet, um, the, the better you'll look and feel, basically. Yeah, great. A couple of other tips coming from people in the audience, I think. Awesome. Um, ma winning MasterChef Aaron, I think that that's you, under the Aaron there. Um, he's suggesting splash of veggie stock is also great for cooking. Um, another one is vinegar. Um, so Aaron's going to be sharing a video tomorrow, so really lucky to have him taking part in the program as well. Um, and someone suggesting applesauce and mashed banana in baking as well. Yeah, yeah, in baking, definitely. Great. Okay, let's move on. Um, so Sonia had a question about milk. Is raw milk from mm -hmm. an organic farmer better than regular dairy? Uh, oh, that's an interesting question. Um, and, and I guess it depends on, on what in what way um, I'd say probably not and um, the interesting thing about um, when we talk about organics and animal products is that unfortunately um, the although it may be on an organic farm um, the pollutants and everything are actually in the atmosphere and they eat on the grass that the animals are eating anyway regardless of whether they're on an organic or not um, and they end up concentrating them in their in their um, tissues and fat as they as they eat them so I, I think you know, um, again, and then you're looking at probably in the raw milk, you're probably looking at a higher fat content um, and numerous other issues. I think milk in general is definitely dairy is, is best avoided. Um, I guess the organic raw milk is probably even more for baby calves. Um, it's less processed, sure, but uh, I, I honestly um, couldn't recommend it. Again, it's the same thing. Um, that I was talking about earlier with you know hemp seed versus olive oil versus canola oil versus even butter to be honest with you um, probably not a huge lot of difference across that spectrum and I'd say it's the same with dairy but I would caution against um, for, for that for the reason that I've just explained um, these organic um, animal products you know you, you're better to eat um, eat pesticide laden fruits and veggies I would say than organic um, animal um, organic animal products, unfortunately. Okay, so one of the topics that has been getting a bit of discussion going in our program group is around plant milks and on your traffic light mm -hmm. system with oh, yeah. bananas and orange, <laughs> sometimes food. Yeah. So, yeah. what are your thoughts on the plant milks and um, how much would you recommend somebody drink if they're going to be drinking them? Yeah, um, well, I tend to say to people, as, as most of the plant-based doctors do, um, that it's really not a, the best idea to drink your calories anyway. Um, and that seems to be what we do with milk in New Zealand anyway. And so it ends up being this thing that you might have instead of a meal. Um, you're, better to, you're always better to eat some real food. And so obviously, if you're wanting to replace stuff in your cereals, in your cup of tea, your coffee, whatever, um, then of course, you know, a little bit of plant milk's not a big deal. And that's why we have it in that in that orange category and it's also you know it can be very useful for for making some of the foods that you know um, we enjoy and that keep us on track with this so I'm certainly not saying you can't have it and that's why it's in the orange category not the red category um, but of course all of these things they're reasonably processed um, and they they don't provide a whole lot of nutrition other than stuff that's added in and, and someone made a good point about you know there being some calcium and iron and um, the thing that is added in that could be kind of useful is, is the B12 that's in them. So I'm certainly not saying that people don't have those, um, but I'm saying they shouldn't be a large part of, of your diet. And I'm sure for most people they aren't. But if you're having a glass of soy milk, there's probably you know, better things you could snack on and, and get more bang for your buck. Right. Um, someone's just asked, where can I find a picture of these categories, um, Ainsley? So we are running a 48-hour program over on Facebook at the moment, and we've shared 
uh, Dr. Luke's traffic light system. So we've got the super green foods to eat as much as we can of, green foods to eat a lot of, orange, one, orange ones to eat sometimes, and red ones to try and avoid. Um, so mm. we can share the link to that Facebook group if anyone would still like to sign up. Yeah, the more yeah. the merrier. Okay, on the topic of um, drinking our calories, Nick has asked, are greens okay in smoothies or should they be chewed? <laughs> I think you know the answer to this already. Um, so you, you, you're better to chew them. Um, but if it's the only way you can get them down, I guess you could make an argument. You know, if it, I think, uh, I forget who it was, but someone asked on the, on the uh, Facebook group, for example, with, with kids, for example, if, um, if they need to eat more of those orange or more high calorie dense foods um, because they have smaller tummies, which fill up more easily with the fiber and we need to make sure that we get enough, um, enough food into them because a lot of the time they sort of forget to eat and things anyway because they're too busy having fun. But anyways, um, so in that situation, you know, if, if you're putting some, if the only way they're going to have greens is, is in a smoothie that you're whipping up for them, then that's probably okay. Also, if you're, I guess if you are a high performance athlete and, and, and Ben would be the person to ask about that, but then you do need, you do have higher calorie needs and sometimes um, plant-based athletes particularly will use, will use smoothies and drinks like that to be, um, to be keeping up with those. But generally, if you're drinking your calories and things, what you are, your energy, um, then you are, I guess, making it easier for yourself to put on weight. So if that's a goal of yours, then that's fine. Um, but otherwise, you'll find that you can very, very much more easily um, down, say, an entire package of greens in one smoothie. Um, whereas if you were to sit there and eat it out of the packet, you might not get that far. So I don't think we need to be looking to have huge and huge amounts of those kinds of nutrients um, that, that to the extent that we would need to be having an entire package at once. Um, but, you know, if, if that's the only way to have them, I think my dad does that every now and then. And so I don't think he really eats greens otherwise. So I'm probably happier that he's getting some at least. Um, so that's kind of the way of looking at it. So it's, it's not optimal, um, but it's also, you know, it's, it's better than not having them at all, I'd say. Thank you. Um, another question on the greens. Do they lose their goodness when they're cooked? Uh, yeah, it's, again, um, so it's, there will be some loss of nutrients, um, but there'll be different nutrients available So it's as well. So it's kind of much of muchness. I, I don't think um, you necessarily need to get too focused on raw or cooked. Um, again, if you're going to eat them one way or another, um, I'd rather that you cook them all and at least eat them um, rather than um, rather than try to eat them raw and then only have like a handful a day because that's all you can handle. So I think it's it's worthwhile just, just having them any way that you feel like eating them. Um, and Dr. Esselstyn will do that with things like an example um, that they gave way back when I saw him in 2010, I think he was here, um, is that when they're making some pasta, for example, just before it's finished boiling, they'll throw in a few um, greens, and then you're getting some greens in with the in with the pasta while you're eating that too, and that's that's perfectly fine. Um, obviously, if you you know um, everyone's probably got the grandmother who boils the broccoli until it goes sort of a brownish colour, and that's probably where most of the nutrients are now in the actual boiling water. Um, but um, so long as you're just steaming lightly I don't think there's any issue with that and, and whatever it, it takes like I, it's it's more a question if you're doing everything 100% perfect um, then that's the time to get worried about whether you're you know whether you're getting the optimal nutrition out of everything that you're eating um, so if you're if you're hitting those goals then yeah you can a lot more Fab. thank you that was very clear um, so we've got a special question now coming from Jennifer Neal. So when you spoke about Coco Pops, her two daughters, Clara and Lily, their ears perked up and so you've got them engaged. Um, they would like to know <laughs> if, zucchini, if zucchini is good for our bodies and apparently they're refusing to eat it at their dinner right now. So <laughs> oh, no. what would you say to Clara and Lily? <laughs> I think it's very good for them and it's going to make, it, make them uh, stronger and grow up um, <laughs> healthier. Yeah. So, eight so of yeah, the so Kenny's good. Yeah. Awesome. I'd say so. Okay. Uh, one coming in from Leslie. Uh, she's asking 
is the Atkins diet super bad then? So if we're looking at you know, the amount of fats and things that you talked about, um, the dairies and the meats and the that sort of thing. Yeah. Yep, <laughs> because none of those foods, so all of those foods are sort of yeah. um, missing out on the first and second um, question. So the Atkins diet is one that we like to um, talk a lot about, I guess, because it's kind of the complete opposite of what we do. Um, the interesting thing about it is there's absolutely no um, benefit over a plant-based um, way of eating when it comes to weight loss. And that's been demonstrated not only, you know, we did we did a decent job, hopefully, of showing that it works really well in Gisborne, but also um, even in, in a lab, um, because there were and the reason they did the study in the metabolic ward of this um, of this hospital was because they the because of the claims that is made specifically by proponents of the Atkins um, diet were saying, well, basically because you're only eating fat, your body gets really used to burning fat. And what they found is actually that wasn't true. Um, so you actually still lost more for high carbohydrate diet. So, and, and I think it's, it's, it's always perilous anyway. If you look at people like the blue zones, they're not thinking, is this a carb, is this a fat, is this protein? And so you'd think, oh, they're all going to be unhealthy and overweight and then not. Whereas we're thinking, you know, about the minutia of, you know, the little details of everything and, and we're the ones who are having the health problems. So I think, um, like you know that the adage that Michael Pollan gives, um, eat food not too much, mostly plants. And, and you know, like I said before, sometimes the best prescription is only plants. Um, and, and a good argument can be made for that. Um, that's you know that's that's the best way of going, and that's the way that humans have eaten throughout. You know, as as you've, as you've seen um, throughout history, there's never been a time where people have been able to exist on a ketogenic diet or a or, a, um, or an Atkins style diet. And it's just um, the, the only time that we ever see ketosis um, in the real world is when people have type one diabetes and that's a very um, dangerous state for people to be in. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a concern, but this is just a fad that will come and go as they do. Mm. Right, so hopefully plant-based will be the next movement and it's definitely not a fad and hopefully that we're convincing people. Um, somebody yeah. else has asked, this is Nikki asking about intermittent fasting. And this mm -hmm. is another thing that's been getting a lot of attention. And some people do do that alongside a plant-based diet. So what would your thoughts yeah. be on if there's any benefits to that? Well, it's, it's interesting because um, the, the issue with it is that most of the research that's been done, well, in fact, all of the research that's been done, as far as I'm aware, is, is on people that are eating a standard diet. So, And there, there are some promising results for those people. Um, and, and it kind of makes sense, um, you know, if, if, if you're not eating all the time, then um, it gives your body some time to actually process things and it probably um, cuts down on people's calories and things. So it's a, it's a difficult one for us to tease out what's actually doing what, because obviously if you put that restriction on people, um, then it may just be that they're actually eating less in the day rather than the fasting per se. Um, but I think there is some evidence that, that some degree of fasting can be useful. Um, but it has, there are issues with it, and I've seen issues and, and read about issues, particularly for women, um, because the um, intermittent fasting can uh, mess with hormones a little bit, um, because the body does, if, if you've got your, if your window's too, too small, um, then it does switch into the state where it thinks like it's starving. It's kind of a, a stressful state for the body to be in, and that can start um, you know, making, making changes and alterations in, in things like hormone levels. And so it's not necessary with a plant-based um, way of eating. Um, some people may find that they feel better doing that, and that's absolutely fine too. Um, but the first thing, I, I don't think that it will make up for uh, basically, you know, eating a standard New Zealand diet or eating a, you know, junk food vegan diet or anything like that, for example. So I don't think it makes up for... Um, how you're eating most of the time. And so how you're eating most of the time is the important thing. Sorry, my screen just turned off. Um, and just just go with that. But I'm not. I'm certainly not saying that there's nothing in it because, um, but I just say do your research on it first um, and sort of think about what your goals are around it because if it's weight loss, um, you really don't need to get too concerned about that on plant-based unless you're not getting the results that you want. Okay, great. Um, 
So someone's asking, can we eat fruit with vegetables or are there any other combinations of foods that we need to be aware of that shouldn't be eaten together? Yeah, this is a really interesting question as well. Um, I have been reading a book that um, some of my friends uh, gave me, the High Carb Health Guys, um, and that talks quite a lot about food combining. To be honest with you, I don't think there's anything in it really um, at moments, and I don't, you know, talking to them, I don't think they're huge advocates of it either. Um, but it is, I don't, I don't think it's based on any sort of sound science and things. Obviously, if you're finding that eating two kinds of foods together seems to make you feel yuck, then um, <laughs> by all means, um, it makes sense to be to be separating those things out but again i think it's kind of an extra for experts thing and i i'd be i'd be rather surprised if there's anything in it because the body doesn't sort of know what you're putting into it it, it doesn't discern between whether it's a fruit or a vegetable or whether it's high carbohydrate or low carbon you know all these kinds of things it's, it's designed as far as we know to digest these foods um whatever way we throw them at at it and yeah, I, I guess, yeah, I, I won't go any further than that because it would just be, you know, ideas that I had in my head about it rather than actual science. <laughs> so, awesome. People, people loving sure. this advice. Um, keeping it simple, love putting fruit in salads and too confusing otherwise. Great news. So that's good. Yeah. Um, yeah. I am conscious that we, we were due to finish at six and we're going to keep going because there's some more questions. But if you do have to leave, then thank you so much for joining. And again, apologies that we were running late, but we will kick on with the yeah. questions. Um, so, Ren has asked, what are the top tips on getting started with low-fat, whole food, plant-based? Mm -hmm. so are there anything um, in addition to what you've covered for people just getting started? Well, I, I guess for people just getting started, the best thing to do is to um, start looking at some foods that you like that are, um, that and recipes that you like and I think that's probably where Hannah could help you out and some of the recipes that have been already so I think that's that's really the main thing there's there's not really any trick to it um I remember when I started out one of the things that helped me start funnily enough um is because I, I'd read Dr Esselstyn's book and it seemed all very complicated and hard and then I you know because there was things like peach cobbler and um, all these sort of Mexican dishes and things, which I really like, but a lot of the ingredients um, are kind of hard to come by in New Zealand. And so I was like, well, you know, does it have to be exactly, you know, to the letter exactly what they're writing in here? Otherwise it doesn't work or it's it's not good for my heart or whatever. Um, and when I went to that conference in the Rotorua um, with Dr. Esselstyn and his, his um, wife, Anne there, she actually had been out to pack and save and um, she brought back wheat bix and she... <laughs> And she actually offended because, um, as some of you are probably aware, the uh, sanitarium is um, is owned by the Adventists and the CHIP um, program that I was up at the conference um, for was um, was also run by the Adventists. So there are quite a few of them there. And um, she she got wheat bix and she also got I think it was Bita Brits or whatever the generic brand was that you got at Pack and Save. And she held them both up and she said, well, actually. You know, these these are both good, but actually this um, generic brand or whatever it was is actually better because it has less salt. And you could just sort of hear the murmur of discontent around the room um, when Wheat Bix was. But anyway, so for me, it was like, okay, look, Wheat Bix is, is good on a whole food plant-based diet, or at least the Esselstyns, who are some of the most strict um, doctors um, as, as far as this goes, um, they are happy for me to be eating Wheat Bix. So I think you know finding a few recipes that you like and finding a few snack foods and just 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 sort of easing into it um and for me you know i really like pasta so i had a lot of pasta um so that you know didn't make it made it pretty easy um and so i, I don't think there's sort of any magic around it but um i think hannah also has some good advice um on that um perhaps in one of her presentations yeah. Yeah, oh, yes. so, so she might, um, she might, she might tomorrow, release some advice on that. <laughs> yeah, tomorrow I'll share the second half of a presentation that I did recently, and we're covering different ideas for breakfast, lunches, dinners, and simple swaps that you can do um, to start getting yeah. some of these whole foods into your diet. Yeah, but I agree with everything yeah. Luke said, and some people prefer to do it really quickly, and then you're going to get the change in your taste buds faster. 
So that's the benefit of you know going all in, giving yourself a few weeks. And another video we'll share tomorrow is from Dr. Martin Williamson, and he's got the three week challenge. So some of you might be wanting to get going with that. And after three weeks, food will taste so different, and things like fruits mm -hmm. and vegetables will just you know they'll just taste amazing. Um, it's a good time of year to get started. Change. So. Yeah, so some people do prefer to, you know, do it a bit more gradually and it can be a little bit more accessible and if it means that, um, that it, you know, you're going to be able to do that and achieve that, then, you know, one meal a day is a good place to start and mm -hmm. breakfast is, is probably the most simple one. And we've got Leslie ask a question, um, as a meat eater eating a lot of salads, veggies and fruit, he feels like um, he's just starting out. What free foods would you mm -hmm. advise to cut out of the diet first to get going? I think for um, me, so the, the, biggest, um, the biggest thing is that legumes are often forgotten about in the traditional Kiwi diet. So if you could cut out one type of meat and replace it with a type of bean or try a range of different chickpeas, black beans, um, those sorts of things, tempeh, after getting started, then that would be my tip. But what about you, Luke? Yeah, I, I agree with that. It depends um, depends person to person. And so obviously um, anything that you're able to do is is, is better than um, not making the change at all. And I think it's awesome that you're, that you're thinking about it. And so making it something sustainable and something you can keep with um, and stick with is, is the most important thing. So, you know, that might at first just mean, you know, one night a week or something that you're having a, a meal that's completely, you know, vegan or vegetarian or, you know, plant-based um, and re taking that meat out from there. Um, it might mean for some people, even though I gave them a bit of a, um, a bad rap, um, that the thing to do is to transition onto those, um, onto some of those foods that you can use to, um, I suppose replace the meat, which would be your, your sun fed chicken and and the uh, no meat mints and that kind of stuff. And and I think you'll transition off those pretty fast too because they are very expensive. <laughs> um, yeah. but you know, for some people that's that's the right way to go. And for others you, you might find that like like Hannah said, you can just go straight to um to beans and legumes or or some some tofu or something like that, or even um portobello mushrooms. A lot of the time people find those have kind of a meaty taste and texture a little bit chewy um, but if none of that sounds right to you then you know you need to choose the thing that you think um, that you can manage and I think it's awesome that you're going to do that and just um, the, the more you can cut out of it and the interesting thing is that I really find uh, the thing most people don't seem to miss the meat that's really interesting um, obviously if that's been the centerpiece of your meal for so long then that's going to take a little bit of getting used to and so that's why it might be you know in, in some cases a, a, a gradual transition might work better for you um, but I, it's very very rare that anyone says that they really miss the taste of, of meat it seems to be interestingly the dairy products and the cheese and that kind of stuff that people um, people seem to be a bit more disappointed about and it sounds like um, from the comments and questions today the oil might be something that some people will, will struggle a little bit to give up as well. But I think once once you manage to make those first steps, it becomes it becomes much easier after then. So just um just keep keep doing what you're doing and and, and making those those changes as, as best you can and I'm sure. Yeah. Oh there we go, that's a really good option as well, jackfruit. Yeah. Jackfruit. There's Jackfruit's so many good. foods yeah, that you yum. probably haven't eaten before and, and it's you're kind of, you know, stopping eating about five different species of animals and their products but you're starting to go on this adventure of you know, using hundreds of other different foods that you probably haven't used before but um, Ben has got a good tip there that the taste of meat is usually linked to the spices so, or what you're cooking it in so use those on the veggies um, yeah yeah is that's a really good point yummy one if you have big chunks of that on the mushrooms like Luke said um, okay, yeah, cool. we've got a few other questions about particular foods. Um, frozen meals. So, if if we cook something, then freeze it, and then reheat it again. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Is that still fine. healthy? Yeah, yeah. fine. Yeah, right. yeah. A lot of people do that actually when they start going plant based. If if you've got the time to do that, um, I'm not sort of organised. Although I might have to be these next few weeks because I've got a lot of work on. 
and it's the start of the year and we've got things to organize but um you know a lot of the time they'll freeze the, the you know do the meal prep at the start of the week um leave half of it in the fridge freeze the other half that's a really good way of of, of doing things when you're eating plant-based the thing is is that and this is one of the reasons why I don't get too concerned about specific nutrients and what's the best way of cooking things and all that kind of thing is because the nutrients is just coming at you from every direction. So if you do this for a couple of days, you know, there's, there's stuff online like um, Chronometer is an interesting um, website where you can put in your what, what foods you've been consuming. It uses the USDA um, database, so it's not exactly accurate for New Zealand, but it gives you a pretty good indication and usually my friends or clients or whoever's done that, they'll they'll be like, oh, my numbers for this were sort of 200 or 300 you know, percent of what I needed. And for just about every nutrient across the board, that's what you'll be hitting. Um, so that's why, you know, a little bit that's lost in the boiling water, a little bit that's, um, you know, because it was cooked instead of raw or, or whatever, really not worth getting too concerned about. So everything that you're eating, and, and that's, that may even be one of the reasons why plant-based is so good for us. It's not necessarily... Um, it's just that um, when you look at animal products in comparison, um, they just don't have any of these antioxidants, phytonutrients and um, vitamins and minerals to the same extent, um, especially for the calorie density that, um, that the plant foods do. Great. Okay. We've got a few questions about uh, white rice. Is it really that bad? Is it better for young children? And then I'm just going to mention a few other ones. Mm -hmm. Um, is honey okay? Is Himalayan rock salt okay? And is broccoli much better than other cruciferous vegetables? Okay. So we've got that was a lot. Broccoli, so I think my my memory. So broccoli, rock salt, honey, and white rice. White rice. So we'll start with white rice, I guess. Um. So what Doctor McDougall taught me is that you know any starch is better than the alternative of, of having say an animal product or something like that and or you know an extra couple of tablespoons of oil so you're always better to eat that white rice um i for kids um i think it's perfectly acceptable and it may be a case of again you're able to get more calories into them with the or more energy into them with the white rice and the brown rice um i think they're probably if they if they're plant-based they're going to be getting their fiber from other you know sources so it's not such a concern um and then you know when you look at it yes nutritionally brown rice is, is definitely a better option um and that, that's that's great but um if it's the difference between white rice and no rice um then or white rice and no other grain um then I'm, i'd go with the white rice i think that's perfectly perfectly fine i wouldn't get too worried about it if you look at you know the, there's always the concern that, um, especially when, you know, when we talk about carbs and things, that white rice is, is is fattening or something, and and you know, so people are making cauliflower rice and all these kinds of things, which is such a waste of cauliflower, if you ask me. But anyways, um, and then if you look at you know the, the the Chinese and the Japanese and basically everyone through through Asia, they've based large amounts of their diet on this. In fact, the Chinese diet, I believe, was eighty percent. Um, maybe it was even 90 but it was very very high in carbohydrate until um, relatively recently um, and as they have reduced the amount of rice that they're eating and started having more of the kind of western foods that we have and their, their dietary profile has changed literally from i kid you not from about 80 percent carbohydrate down to similar to us maybe about um 50 percent or so um and since then the, the rates of type 2 diabetes have skyrocketed and their, you know, their, their levels of obesity and things. So um, there's no issues when it when it comes to that. And you can look at those peoples, and they're traditionally very, very slim. Um, and even in, in, in those cultures, they, it wasn't like they were eating brown rice necessarily. In fact, white rice is considered to be um, the thing for them. So um, I, yeah, I wouldn't get too concerned about it. Um, what else do we have? So, Broccoli. On a little bit. Is broccoli better than other cruciferous vegetables? Cruciferous vegetables. Oh, I think a variety of things is good. Um, yeah, when it comes to sulforaphane, which is what Dr. Greg is talking about, I think broccoli's the the, the um, you know you, you could someone could prove me wrong on this um, for sure, but I'm pretty sure that broccoli has the highest amounts of it. Um, 
and probably it's just good for other things as well. So I would, I would, um, you know, if, if you hate broccoli, then the other cruciferous vegetables are awesome. Um, <laughs> so I think any any of them is, is better than none. Um, if you can get some broccoli in, then uh, the reason I was pointing it out is just because Dr. Gregor loves it, you know, and he's obviously done a lot of thinking and research about this and looked at a lot less than I have or will ever want to about broccoli. So um, he's he's pretty big on it. So I think, you know, it's not, not to say that if, if you um, if you can't handle broccoli um, that you're not going to be healthy, um, but it's to say that, um, yeah, if, if, you, if you don't mind a bit of broccoli every now and then, um, then it's a good thing to be, to be putting in the mix. Right, and there is a, a list of other super greens on your Traffic Light system as well, and they're all yeah. wonderful for us. So definitely encourage that had... broccoli is not in season. Yeah, then we had honey. So then um, honey, yeah. Yeah, honey is at right at the, um, how do we say this? At sort of the, the border between whole foods, plant-based and vegan. Um, so honey is, if, so when I'm talking here, I'm talking as a proponent of whole food plant-based. And so people may have various um, you know, ethical reasons why they don't want to eat honey. And that's awesome. Um, and that's fine. When it comes to health, it doesn't seem like there's you know really any difference between using say honey or or, or maple syrup. I I don't think it has any any miraculous healing properties um, from what I've been able to find out so far. So I don't think there's any need to use honey. Um, but if you like honey, it it does fit into that orange category. Mm. And again, quite concentrated in energy. So. We're yeah, to so it's, it's, it's a sweetener. Back. It's like, yeah, yeah. So, so it's, it's sugar. It's off. it's basically sugar. So all of those things yeah, are very very similar. But if you if you want to have something on your oatmeal in the morning to keep it sweet and you don't have an issue with um with having honey, then then um you just as well to do that as you add a maple syrup or something like that on it. To be honest. Yeah, um, dates, whole dates are another good one, which can be used in baking as well. Yeah. Okay, so the last one on that list was salt, and Himalayan salt was mentioned by somebody. Oh yeah, Himalayan salt. Um, yeah, those minerals you're going to get everywhere else, to be honest with you. Um, so the the issue more will be the sodium. Um, salt is, yeah, it's it's something as as you probably saw on the on the traffic light. If you haven't had a look at it yet, then you'll see that it's in the in the orange category. So if you had really high blood pressure, if you had heart disease, if you had an autoimmune condition, because it's interestingly, it seems to be linked to um, immune responses and things like that, um, then certainly you would think about trying to reduce that salt intake as much as possible. I don't think people are doing themselves any benefit um, from having Himalayan um, rock salt. Um, I also think the other thing that's interesting about it, that choice, is that um, the one thing we do know that we are deficient in in New Zealand, generally speaking, is iodine. And when you get the Himalayan salt, you're not getting any iodine. And when you're going whole food plant-based mostly, um, you are hopefully going to re reduce your amount of foods that have iodized salt in them. Um, so that, that can be something that we can, can be worth considering um, supplementing. And just as a general note, uh, according to the Ministry of Health, pretty much all New Zealanders are deficient in iodine regardless because you know for one thing we're not using as much salt as we used to and um, where it used to just sit on the table and we'd have the salt shaker and just you know throw that over our food to actually make it taste like anything um, people are doing that less and less nowadays so it's a less effective way of um, of dosing the population than it has been in the past so um, like I, don't, I don't think there's any health benefits to it to be to be you know I did look into it relatively recently um, because and someone right. and on, was reading and on that the suggested of that. Supplementation. We've got a few people asking about B12, which is really important. So, do we need to take a B12 supplement? Um, do we need to take a B12 supplement? Yes, yes, you do. Um, and especially if if you're doing this one, if you're doing this 100, then it's it's sensible to take a B12 supplement. Um, yeah. That's the only thing that you definitely need to supplement, and you can like it is available. And you know when you're getting it in, in plant-based foods, it will like for example the um, soy milk or we've we've talked about earlier. 
um, it is present there, um, but it's not um, it's not an amount that one glass would do it for you for the day, or get you the amount that you need necessarily. Um, and B12 is something that's really important for us to supplement because even though um, everyone, anyone, regardless of what they're eating, um, whether they're omnivorous or um, vegetarian or vegan, um, can get the B12 deficient. Most it's it's much much more prevalent within the vegan, um, you know, or plant based um, eating community that people are low on B12 than it is with everyone else because the main place that they're getting it from is from um, from dairy products and also from um, meat from from ruminants and the ruminants make it in their gut um, sort of a, so it gets into their tissues and things and so that's how everyone else is getting their source of b12 right so we've got some questions around oh. what dosage and is there any preference between pill or spray um, and what about b12 from mum yeah. yeah right um so b12 from mum comes with a big whack of um sodium so it's the worst possible source of it really unless you really really love marmite and you're prepared to have it many times a day um I don't think it's a reliable source um, and it would fit in that orange category definitely. Um, so, you know, a little bit of marmite every now and then, fine. Um, but it's not it's not a good source to base your um, to base your bed intake on. As far as dosage goes and what ones to get and what the the honest truth is that we don't one hundred percent know. <laughs> But what we like the the daily requirement is about two and a half um, micrograms, which isn't a lot. But the way that we absorb it is weird, and so you don't necessarily get the the dose. Say if you take a thousand microgram tablet, you won't get a thousand microgram of it. You get about one plus ten percent or something like that. So it's um it's more a case of um, for at least for adults, um, you can go and get your B12 tested with your GP um, once you've been taking, you know, got sort of a regimen going as far as what you're supplementing. Um, then if it's staying about right and not going off the charts or dipping down too low, then you'll know that you're, you're taking enough for you and you're taking it at the right times and all this kind of thing and you're getting your absorption right. I would say as a rough, as a rough guideline, um, probably taking um, you know, I used to say 5,000. I used to take 2,500 twice a week. Um, Dr. Greger has different ideas about how much we should be getting and it, get, it gets complicated, but I would say a minimum of 1,000 micrograms three times a week, you know, as, as, a, as a rough guideline. Um, otherwise, Otherwise, um, what I'm thinking I might do at the moment is get the clinician's choice one, which is about 50 micrograms, so it's not very much, and um, just be taking that sort of once a day, and that will probably give, you know, one plus 10% you know, of that, which isn't very much, but probably enough one or two drops a day, plus, you know, you're getting a little bit here and there from other sources, and it probably will be all right. So there's there's a bit of debate about whether it's whether it's okay to go really high on it at the moment or to, you know, whether you're better to err on the side of caution. And as a general rule of supplements, you're better to be a little bit cautious, I think. So uh, I am in the process of writing an article about this um, at the moment, but it's it's a lot more work than I thought it would be. So it'll, it'll be out at some point and, and um, it, so you check out um, the Better Base um, Facebook page and things, and she'll I imagine Hannah will post it in the group if I don't, um, so you can see it then with some guidelines. Yeah, it's a question that constantly comes up and is really important when yeah. people are taking the supplements, so we want to put something yeah. out there just to try and help clarify that. Um, and yeah, no so, one's got any definitive. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone um, says something a little different, question. so it'll be good to get some agreement. Sure. Yep. So on a more personal note, someone is asking, um, Luke, are you vegan or just plant-based? <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I'd say I'm ethical vegan as well, but I didn't start out being, that wasn't the reason that I got interested in this. Um, I, I was vegan since I was four years old, so I used to have a pet lamb, and um, it was down from my uncle's arm um, in the Hawke's Bay, and 
uh, yeah, so I, I looked after that lamb and my parents made the mistake of telling me what would happen to it when it went back to the farm and so I stopped eating meat at that point. And however, I didn't necessarily think that being vegetarian was very healthy. I always thought it was something I was doing for the animals and as I got older and into my teenage years and a bit, um, I don't know, a bit, how do you say it? A bit less in touch with my emotions and things I think as sometimes you do as a teenager boy um, I became less concerned about the animal aspect of it but it was just something that I did so I kind of continued on with it um, and I was always a bit disappointed that I wouldn't ever be able to look like the models on the front of men's um, fitness and men's health because I couldn't eat all those chicken breasts and things so um, I guess I was sort of an apologetic vegetarian and um, then when I was in my um, second year of medical school, I came across the China study by complete chance online and started reading that and realized that actually um, a vegan, you know, or a plant-based diet would be a much um, healthier option than even vegetarian. And then when I found that out, um, obviously it, it wasn't a straight away thing for me, as you probably guessed from some of the stuff I've been talking about. Um, but I, at that point, decided to, um, to change what I was eating. And um, pretty soon after that, I also decided, well, you know, if I'm, if I'm not eating the stuff, then why would I, um, why would I, you know, wear stuff from animals and things like that as well. But, you know, that's, that's, that's a very personal choice. But, um, yeah, uh, I, it doesn't, um, it didn't initially inform my um, transition. But, and I think for a lot of people, that's kind of the way it goes um, for them as well. Because once you realize you don't actually need um, to eat animals and that humans don't need to to be able to survive and to be able to thrive in fact and um, it becomes a very easy thing to to just do away with everything else that's related to it but that's not a requirement obviously of, of being whole foods plant-based but thanks for the question <laughs> thank you for sharing your story with us Luke uh, for full disclosure if anybody's wondering um, I'm <laughs> still vegan as well <laughs> <laughs> I came into this mainly through the environmental um, concerns and that, that video that I shared today, um, it was an event which was focused on the environment, so I spoke mostly about the environment, um, although then trying to gain more motivation, I think that's the biggest thing when you're wanting to make some of these changes is finding your motivation, I then looked into the health and the ethical sides of it and then that just led me down the path of trying to eat mostly whole plant foods and also removing animal products from all other areas of my life as well. So um, I'm conscious we're nearly at 6.30, so we'll aim to wrap up in the next five minutes. Um, so just one more question, um, end on something fun. Going out for dinner. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Someone's asking, what would your advice be on going out for dinner? And um, do you make special requests? Yeah. Uh, um, that's a very good question. Um, so there's been a lot of very good questions actually. So I think it depends how often you go out for dinner, um, at the risk of, you know, um, getting in trouble with Dr. Esselstyn and then and some, some other people. Um, but you know, for, for most of us, it's, it's, it's a special occasion. It depends on where you're at with this and what your goals are. Obviously, if you're someone like, um, Grant Dixon, who just made that, you know, the documentary about, um, uh, the big fat lie about the heart disease and everything and you know he had heart attack and things and he's on a strict sort of Esselstyn way of eating now um, then obviously you can't make these um, I suppose allowances for there to be a bit of oil or whatever else in, in the food so um, if you're in, if that's if that's the box that you that you check, then of course um, that's the best way to be doing things is to be you know discussing with the restaurant. And and when I first when I first started doing this, that's what I did do. Um, and you know I had some decent meals. I also had some very um, not very exciting meals as well. Um, but it was it was good exercise. And I think when we can, it, it can be very helpful for us if you feel comfortable doing it. To kind of, to 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 ask your waiter or waitress, um, you know, do you mind doing this without any oil, or if you can't do it without any oil, do you mind doing it with just the, the smallest amount you can? And what that does is it puts it in their mind that you know there's there's kind of a demand for um, 
reducing the amount of oil that's in there or even oil free foods and we you know through through the efforts of a, of a good friend of mine here uh, mostly um yusuf who some of you might know um we managed to get um the the botanist in um, royal bay in wellington doing some oil free options and they actually unfortunately they changed their menu recently and they don't have the oil free options on the menu anymore but you can ask for the things to be made without oil or less oil and um so it depends on it depends on your goal at the moment i'm on a bit of a fitness um you know because as, as i imagine most of us are because it's the start of the year um so i'm i'm gonna avoid all that for um at least this month and um even when i'm in melbourne I'm, i've got some friends over there who i'll be able to ask where places i can go to because um yeah i i think uh, um and, and the issue now as well i think too is that there's more and more vegan options um <laughs> So now we're getting even more. So now we can get, um, you know, in Wellington, we just had Lord of the Fries open, for example. Um, so we now, whereas previously you might have gone to a restaurant and the vegan option might have been something that was still reasonably actually based around plants, we now do have quite a lot of processed um, stuff making its way in. Um, you know, deep fried sort of sun fed, sun -fed chicken, burgers, that kind of stuff. Um, so that kind of thing is still best avoided, I would say. Um, and you probably, to be honest with you, if you've been doing this for a little while, um, you won't feel good after eating that. And it might not, it might even be a case of worse feeling good. Um, so I, I think do what you're comfortable with. And if you if you do feel comfortable saying to the to the waiter or waitress, um, you know, can you reduce the oil a little bit? Can you do something that's got brown rice in it instead of white rice or whatever it is? Then you're helping us all, so so do that. Um, and if you do have any successes with that, then do let us know. Um, but again, if you're out with a group of friends and you're just getting new to you're just new to this, and already giving you the look for asking for something vegan or, or or plant based in the first place, you might find it's easier just to go with the vegan option um, and, and not to con get too concerned about it. But what you will do now, and, and I've kind of ruined things for you all, is you'll notice how much oil they actually put in these things. And, and it does concern me a little bit that perhaps we're almost making the the option that should be the healthiest one on the menu the not so healthy one by sort of allowing that to happen. And, and I think it doesn't make it taste any better a lot of the time anyway. So short answer to the question is um, is, is do what you feel comfortable with, I think. Um, but if you have goals, um, you know, health goals and things, then it's, it's, um, it's maybe a matter of... Um, Finding a way, finding a few restaurants that can do that, and um, yeah, and, and sort of sticking with that. Right, well said. And you mentioned Joseph, and he's done a great job setting up the New Zealand Whole Food Plant Based Kiwis Facebook group. So if you're yeah, interested yeah. in another group to join um, that lasts longer than forty eight hours, then that one is a good one that you can go to. He's also created a map where he's mapped out places that we can eat that do do whole food plant-based options and oil free so that's a good one to have mm -hmm. a look at okay we're going to wrap up and we'll take a couple of these questions there's one about alcohol and caffeine and we'll try and answer them over in the group tomorrow um, if you liked this and enjoyed it and you think that we should do more webinars in the future then let us know and we can look at this and hopefully we've learned from our technological issues um, so yeah. things out for next time. <laughs> and as, as you've seen, um, we also like to work with a whole lot of other um, athletes and you know, chefs and people who are doing amazing things living plant based. So we can bring you people with different topics. Yeah. Um, another awesome thing that is coming up, which you might be interested in, is Luke and I have been working over the last six months or so putting together a program which is four weeks long. It's called Future Proof and it's going to be online and it's for people who really want to learn more about going towards the whole food plant-based lifestyle we've done a lot of recording with Luke um, several different modules and we'll be sharing some more information about that and we've also got lots more bonus content from a lot of the people contributing over these couple of days and we also cover the environmental benefits as well so if you want to learn more about the sustainability um, linked to a whole food plant-based diet then yeah we'll be sending you some more information about that and um, yeah, so thank you all so much for joining in on this. I think yeah. after the technology issues, it's been a great success. Thank you to Luke again for you know, generously giving your time. I know you've got a lot on and 
I look forward to hearing you talk in Melbourne as well. It's going to be awesome seeing your doctor's <laughs> cool. nutrition come to life. Yeah, great. Um, so on that note, um, I think we'll wrap that up. You should also come and follow us at The Better Base on Facebook and then Luke's um, Facebook page is called Two Zesty Bananas. We've also got mail lists if you want to keep up with other things like this that are going to be happening. Great. So cool. good luck with eating all of the plants. And, yeah, we look forward to hearing how you get on. And someone was saying, was this recorded? It is recorded. Hopefully we can get it uploaded to you. Um, and yeah. I'll be working away tonight doing that. So, yeah, do let us know how you get on because it's always really awesome to hear about the stories. And then we can share those hopefully you know spread 